Hi everyone, Anthony Fantano here, internet's busiest music nerd. Hope you're doing well. Let's talk about pop music. Yeah, everyone's favorite genre of music pop music. It's in the name. It's popular. With uh, some reviews and takes that have come out recently from yours truly, uh, namely my thoughts on the latest Olivia Rodrigo project, there have been some opinions and perspectives shared among my audience uh, saying that over the years I've like softened toward pop music or uh, maybe I've become a bit more of a poptimist. Maybe I'm not as critical of pop music as I could possibly be. And I mean, look, I'm a critic. I could always be more critical. I could become the most disgusting, bitter, jaded hater on the planet if that is what you want. Force myself not to enjoy anything, basically rip every record apart that comes my way, and spiral down into a pit of constant dissatisfaction and misery because I don't like anything. But no, truth be told, I actually enjoy quite a bit of the music uh, that comes by my desk every year. And some of my most favorite releases of the year, especially as of late, have been pop releases or some of the most popular releases of the year. I would like to address this phenomenon by taking it in a few different chunks. Starting with, am I generally getting softer on pop music? Hey, can, can we do like a, a, a title screen or something? The world wants to know. I will say when the needle drop originally started as a podcast and a blog and you know later developed into a YouTube channel, uh, when it came to popular music and the most popular releases of the year, I was usually pretty, uh, not hateful, but uh, more ambivalent. I didn't personally see it as my place to uh, review or dive into the biggest records of the year because I figured there were already a million and one outlets out there that were doing that sort of thing. I, at the time, would have much rather focused on releases that were smaller, were more obscure, that just made more sense to me personally. However, as time went on and my audience grew and they had more of an input in what I was reviewing week to week, I was getting a lot more requests to cover bigger releases, some of which I loved and thought were great, some of which I just thought were mid. Regardless, popular music has gained more and more of a stake in terms of like my music listening and music reviewing diet every year. And I haven't really seen any trends in my viewership or um, my audience demands that would lead me to believe that I should be heading in the other direction. After all, I still do review a fair amount of obscure music every month just to maintain my sanity and you know, also because it fits into my personal preferences. And these reviews, even when I wear a yellow flannel in the review, uh, are routinely the ones that will get the least views every month. In the process of finding a compromise between what I personally would prefer to review and what my audience uh, month to month demands I review, uh, of course I'm reviewing bigger and bigger releases, covering artists that years ago I wouldn't have necessarily seen myself uh, talking about or reviewing, be that Beyonce, be that Katy Perry, be that Taylor Swift, the list goes on. However, increased coverage doesn't necessarily mean increased favorability. Even with that being said, there are a fair number of super huge, super mainstream releases uh, dropping every year that I love, give favorable coverage to, that I wouldn't have necessarily seen myself talking about or maybe even raving about back in 2011 or 2012. And the question to answer is why? Why is this happening? Or let's, let's do another screen. Pop music has gotten better. <laughs> That is my honest to God opinion. And look, I'm not basing this qualitative judgment on the entire history of pop music since it began. No, it's more since when I personally grew up with pop music in the 2000s. While I don't think there's one single decade for pop music that is just absolute and utter trash where nothing good came out, I do think I came of age during one of the more mid eras of pop music. I'm a 90s kid. I grew up with the memory and experience of uh, some of the best names in the game when it came to pop. Michael Jackson, Madonna, Janet, the list goes on. But around the late 90s and early aughts, things were kind of changing because you began to see the extreme corporatization and monopolization of old media with the majority of what you watched, listened to, and read falling under the ownership of just a handful of companies, which in turn impacted music-based media too, leading to less local programming, less unique programming, forcing editors, DJs, the creators of this programming to look at engaging audiences in a less specific way, a less niche way, and instead in more of a one 
size fits all kind of way. What can we broadcast out onto the airwaves that will just mildly satisfy the largest amount of people possible at the same time, which is how you land upon art and artists that aren't necessarily interesting, but they're just kind of digestible. This is essentially how you arrive at the radio wave saturation of uh, pretty boy, bubblegum, club-friendly gangster rap, the soulless and annoying post-grunge Christian rock, as well as faceless and carefully engineered boy bands and 2000s pop divas, many of whom were working with the same handful of Swedish songwriters and producers to churn out their hits. Now, looking back on this era, were there some good records and tracks and interesting artists and flashes in the pan here and there? Sure, there absolutely were. But also on top of it, we're talking about one of the most homogenous and singular eras of popular music that there ever was. I know so far this video is like mostly an anecdotal oral history, but take it from somebody who isn't just like, you know, a fucking YouTube music reviewer. I have studied old media. I've studied corporate media. I've worked at radio stations for years before I even got onto YouTube. That is the world I escaped from because I saw there being much more potential potential in doing stuff on the internet. And look, when it comes to nostalgia factor or the legacy and impact of the various pop artists who come out of the 2000s, uh, there's a lot to be thankful for. I mean, one of my favorite current trends in music uh, has been hyper pop with Charlie XCX's Charlie record uh, making my number one album of the year that it dropped. And obviously everything to come out of the hyper pop scene is hugely influenced by the retro futurism of Y2K era pop music. With that being said, the 2000s, in my view, especially having lived through it and been on the front lines, it, it was not one of the most creative eras for, you know, mainstream stuff. It was one of the more formulaic eras, honestly. I still very much prefer the pop and radio music of the other decade that I lived through, the 90s, and even a lot of what has hit the mainstream in the 2010s, which leads to my argument that things have gotten more interesting and better over the years that I've been alive anyway. Because today in the internet era, the information age, I see a lot more randomness and freedom and creativity, and I guess a bit more of an X factor when it comes to how artists are are able to produce their music and present themselves. And look, that's not to say the music industry overall is like a better, more equitable and a, and a fairer place for artists. It's most certainly not. But at least in terms of what artists can and can't do on their records, it seems like there's just a little bit more leeway than there used to be. And that there's a lot more cross pollination going on between the mainstream and the underground too. Take, for example, Taylor Swift routinely working with on her records of producers who have deep roots in the indie scene. That was not a regular occurrence at all in the 2000s and to the extent that it was, like, you didn't hear those vibes cropping up in the music. But you hear that on Folklore. You hear that on Evermore. You hear that on multiple Lana Del Rey records. You hear that on the new Olivia Rodrigo record. You hear it in the new albums of artists who have been around the block for a little bit, as well as newcomers like Billie Eilish, who made her big breakout debut album uh, in a bedroom with her brother, who put some absolutely weird and wild production on that album that just wouldn't have flown were that album to have dropped in the 2000s, which is kind of another telltale sign that things have definitely changed and improved over the years. Because as influenced as uh, Olivia Rodrigo may be by someone like uh, Avril Lavigne, for example, or as much as Charlie XCX uh, may borrow from Britney Spears on an album, like their records would absolutely not have done much of anything in the 2000s, or at least wouldn't have been allowed to fly by the corporate executives at whatever label that they were trying to drop it on at the time. Their music would have been categorized as too weird, too raw emotionally. This paradigm shift has been pretty well documented in the recent history of pop music. Look at, for example, how recent documentary coverage of Britney Spears uh, talked about how squeaky clean her image needed to be, especially at the time that she was initially breaking through into the music industry. Or look at the way Miley Cyrus began rebelling as she kind of changed her image, uh, moving from, you know, teen, tween, pop icon to whatever the heck she's doing now. Or look at newcomers like Lil Nas X. Do you think back in the 2000s, the mainstream and the public would have allowed for an artist that black, that queer, that multi-genre to have the number one song, the longest running number one song in the country ever? No. 
that is very much more a product of the modern era. <laughs> and these changes are even seeping into the recent work of artists who are essentially legacy at this point too. For example, look at Beyonce's change in evolution over the years, like going from her early solo records to the highly conceptual Lemonade, and now with her most recent LP, this tightly sequenced, queer-coded, eccentric, wild, off-the-fucking-wall ode to dance and house music. If Beyonce tried to drop that record in the mid-2000s, she would have been laughed out of the record label for making tracks that sounded either too old or were just not radio friendly enough, or were not playing specifically enough to the R&B lane that she was pigeonholed into. Look, what I'm saying here is not the complete and final say on every single thing uh, that has happened with the recent progression of pop music. I've glossed over a lot of things, including like, you know, Lady Gaga's early run, but ultimately my point still stands that things since I first started listening to pop music and since I first started reviewing music have changed quite a bit as far as how pop music sounds, what is okay and not okay in pop music in the mainstream, and once again, how mainstream pop and the underground currently have this really interesting kind of symbiotic relationship that just wasn't there prior. Even around the time of Lady Gaga's debut or the fame monster, you weren't getting crazy collabs and crossovers like the Chromatica remix album, for example, th that just wasn't happening. So to the allegation that I'm more engaged with pop music today and more favorable to it uh, than I was years ago, yeah, maybe guilty as charged, but honestly, uh, pop music has gotten a lot better over the years. It honestly has. It's gotten more interesting, it's gotten more daring, and it's gotten a little more subversive too. That's not to say it's like, you know, as subversive as it could be, and it's the best and most interesting music out there, I'm not making that claim. And I still do review a fair amount of obscure and experimental stuff on the channel that I think you guys should pay attention to as well, like the new Sprain album. Ultimately, I think the genres got a lot more versatile and mature, and that should be pointed out and celebrated. And I'm not just trying to sell you on like, you know, some stupid poptimist bullshit because uh, I'm mad at rock critics for not taking pop music enough seriously, so I need to overcompensate by saying a bunch of releases that are actually kind of mid and formulaic are amazing. I mean, look guys, I've been doing this work for over a decade now. I'm not trying to come through and say that like over that course of time, nothing about me has changed. Of course, like my taste today is not the same thing that it used to be uh, over a decade ago, but as ridiculous as a statement as this may seem to make, I haven't changed. Pop music has. Let me know what you think uh, down in the comments below. Uh, you're the best. Mwah. Over here next to my head is another video that you can check out. Hit that up or the link to subscribe to the channel. Anthony Fantano, pop music uh, forever.